I want to start with a rather uh, artistic kind of picture of the plastic age that we're living in. So that's like uh, the most expensive photograph that's ever been sold um, for $3.3 .3 million. That's Andreas Gurski's 99 cent um, uh, uh, piece. And I believe it's a very, very good image of the plastic age or the situation that we're living in. So you see a supermarket with an abundance of those synthetic, colorful, bright, cheap materials. They have brought a lot of benefits to society. It's very appealing. We want to buy it. Um, but then also you see like in between, in the aisles, in between the shelves, you see like people are there, but they're somehow lost and they're a bit confused in this abundance of synthetic materials of plastics. And I believe that's quite, uh, quite a good characterization of the situation we are in. So we're, we're, we're having the benefits of all those materials, but somehow we're also a bit lost in this kind of synthetic world. And then I just want to take you back just to, 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 to ask, so how did we end up in this plastic age that we're seeing today? And I just want to, uh, to remind you of the 1950s. So that's like the cover page of Life magazine in the 50s. And what you're seeing is an extremely happy American family. And they're celebrating the throwaway life. So just picture this kind of enthusiasm, this kind of excitement about those synthetic uh, materials, those plastic materials back in the days, right? So they really improved uh, living conditions. For example, the article says you cannot read it, but by using all these throwaway plastic items, uh, the average housewife is saving like 40 hours of cleaning time. So they really like empowered, especially women back in the day, just by liberating them from all this housework. Um, just think about like when, 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 when plastic diapers were invented and they didn't need to go through um, uh, uh, washing all the diapers, etc. So just to give you a background, there was like really this excitement over those fantastic new materials. And they could be just basically applied to everything. So where are we now? Now we're seeing those pictures, right? And, and, and the public sphere's attitudes towards plastic have completely changed, at least in the last years. Uh, and that has been driven by, by pictures like that. So you see like a dead Liza and Albatross that was collected um, at Midway Atoll in, in the Pacific. You see uh, a belly full of plastic. So the parents of those uh, Albatross chick feed plastic um, to their offspring. And those are, of course, very emotional, very arousing, very iconic images that have basically driven pl public attitudes toward plastic materials just want to give you another very recent example. So that's a sperm whale that just stranded two weeks ago in Sardinia. And when they dissected it, um, they found like 22 ki uh, kilograms of plastic bags in its stomach. So this is really like what's, what's driving our attitudes <coughs> now. I'm going to talk about microplastics, so the smaller pieces of plastic litter that we find in environments. And that's a picture I've taken at Trondheim a very pristine beach. You can find plastic items there as well. Uh, and I want to investigate or look at with you at the impacts on the environment, but then also impacts on academia and societies. Why am I talking about microplastics specifically, really? Because there's such a contagious uh, issue in academia. So everybody is obsessed with microplastics these days. And for that, I've just plotted the plastic production that, that humankind is like uh, producing on a global scale. So you see that nice exponential trend. So we're approaching 400 million tons plastic produced each year. And with a, quite a delay of some decades, you see that explosion and exponential growth in papers on microplastics. And I'm not going to say that microplastics are the new pollutant in the academic literature. I'm just saying that we are really quick uh, in, 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 in generating knowledge on this kind of um, contaminant of emerging concern. I will have three key messages today. So first, I will try to show that based on the fragmentary and limited scientific evidence we have, microplastics um, may pose risks to aquatic environments.
In the second part, I will talk a bit about or look a bit at the discourse that we're having over the impacts of plastic pollution within academia. So there is not like a very clear opinion, so there's discourse over there, but then also in the public sphere. And I will make the argument that, that um, different conceptions of, of what risk actually is lead to this kind of public perception of, of plastics and microplastics. And in the third and final part, I will, will make the case that societies have decided um, and they find plastic pollution unacceptable. And that's something we just need to deal with as researchers. Even though knowledge is not like full and, 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 and is never complete, that's, that's kind of a, a, a reality we need to adopt to. Let's look at microplastics and the environment and, and, and let's take a look at the state of play in environmental um, sciences. So we have written and published an awful lot of papers on microplastics, more than 2,000. That's like a bit an older number. I would guess now it's over 3,000 papers. I sometimes wonder who's going to read all those. But if you look at like um, the overall bunch of papers, only about 6.7% um, of, pay, uh, of publications of studies are really on the impacts on the toxicity of microplastics. So what we are doing these days is we are publishing a lot just by going out to the ocean, going to our beaches, collecting microplastics, counting them, and then we are publishing that, whereas we understand very little about their actual toxicity. If we look at this, this small chunk over here, then like um, uh, environmental toxicology is basically in 70% of the studies using polystyrene, which is one particular polymer, we, we have like a lot of different polymers, but we're really obsessed with studying polystyrene uh, for very pragmatic reasons, because we can buy it and it's uh, sinking in water, so the density is quite appropriate. So, so most of the knowledge is on, on one, one polymer. <coughs> And then we're also a bit obsessed with very small microplastics. Again, the majority of toxicity studies is like analyzing the, the effects of, of uh, microplastics that are smaller than 100 micrometer. So that's just to settle the stage, really. Um, and you see that there's kind of biases in the way that we do this kind of toxicity studies towards certain polymers and towards certain sizes. <coughs> Sorry, and we're also using those nice spherical beads which, are not, which we know are not really representative for all the microplastics we find in the environment. They're degraded, they're fragmented, <coughs> they're irregular, they're fibers. We hardly find those perfect uh, little microbeads out there, uh, which are blamed for a lot of stuff, uh, especially the microbeads coming from cosmetics. So that's why, why in our group we're using um, those irregular kind of plastic particles made not only from polystyrene, but also from other materials. And what we find very important is to compare the impact that those guys are having with the impact of natural particles. So we're using diatomite, which is like a clay-like particle you find in aquatic systems, just to compare, because we're not so much interested to, sh to show that microplastics are super toxic. We rather are interested in the question, are they more toxic than all the other materials, particles that out are out there in aquatic systems? And we are looking at freshwater species, so m most of the data that we have is focused on the marine system, but we are looking at freshwater species, so water fleas, gamma reeds, um, insect larvae, and a lot of mollusks, so zebra mussels and snails and so on. And what we are also doing is, um, I mean, those guys, they won't only observe microplastics when they're in the, in the environment, they also have like additional stressors. So in the laboratory, we're also stressing them for example, by taking away their food or limiting their food. We're exposing them, uh, for example, to metals or neonicotinoids, pesticides. Um, and then we, we want to see how this additional stress is really modulating the toxicity that microplastics may have. So this is a very, very rough um, overview of kind of a lot of experiments we've been doing with this kind of different species and different polymers. Um, just to give you like kind of an idea, so for example, we've seen that amphipodes and zebra mussels, they tolerate microplastics um, quite well until a, a very high concentration of particles, so their feeding behavior or energy budget is not really affected by those plastic particles. But then if you escalate the dose, you see that uh, Daphnia magna, the, the, the great water flea, uh, is, is reacting and, and then that different kinds of microplastics 
have a negative impact on their um, reproduction. So those seem to be sensitive for microplastics. And then if you escalate the concentration even more, you see that chironomids, which is aquatic uh, larvae of an insect, they also um, uh, react uh, to, to PVC microplastics. So something is going on there, but remember at extremely high concentrations. So what happens if we compare that toxicity to natural particles is you see that the zebra mussel and, and the gamma reeds, they don't really re react to natural particles as well. However, for the water flea we see, that's like the toxicity <coughs> that natural particles are inducing. And that happens at about one order of magnitude um, higher concentration than microplastics. So for those guys, microplastics appear to be a bit more toxic than natural particles. And the same is true for chironomids. So you see the natural particles don't affect them at all, really, whereas the PVC microplastic does. What happens now if we add like extra stressors? So for example, for the zebra mussel, we just increase the temperature. And you see that that had an overall effect like on the energy budget of that, of that zebra mussel, but not really in terms of uh, additional microplastic effects. When we limit the food supply to Daphnia, we see that the microplastic uh, effect, the toxicity, is shifted by one order of magnitude approximately. So the additional stress of just lacking food is increasing the toxicity of microplastics. And that's something that animals normally encounter in environment. There is never abundant food um, in supply. And we see that if we add a neonicotinoid to, uh, to the microplastics in, in our insect model, that this neonicotinoid is really increasing the toxicity um, of those microplastics in itself, it didn't have any effect. So what you're seeing is that when you move towards more realistic scenarios really, using other types of particles, comparing to natural particles, uh, using additional stressors which would occur in the environment as well, that all modulates the toxicity of microplastics. I want to take a little, a little break here. There's more toxicity to data to talk about. And, and we have in the literature, uh, even though it's only 6%, quite some, some, some knowledge on, on the impacts. So um, it would be time just to take a break, keep calm, and just do a risk assessment. And that's something that we normally do in environmental toxicology for chemicals, right? So we are comparing the exposure to a certain chemical, say a pesticide, with its hazard and then just determine based on that the risk. So this is very, one very recent uh, paper on the risk of microplastics in aquatic systems. And here you see a cumulative distribution on the levels of microplastics in the environment. Um, so those are the most heavily polluted places. Those are the most pristine places. And you can compare this kind of exposure levels in the environment to the hazard, to the toxicity that those particles have in, uh, based on laboratory studies. And you see that here, for example, Danurerio, which is the zebra fish, is reacting most sensitive to microplastics. So if you just compare those two um, distributions, exposure and hazard, you see like there is six orders of magnitude space in between. So we would need to escalate environmental levels um, of microplastics by 100,000 fold at least, or 1 million fold. <laughs> to really see um, a kind of uh, a risk negative impacts on the ecosystem. So that was published in 2018. And then uh, uh, a couple of months later, there was another very similar study. But they have performed a probabilistic risk assessment, taking into account more data. Not to go into detail, again, here they plot the levels of microplastics, which we know of in the environment, for different continents. So we see like Europe is over here. So we have quite low, um, quite low levels. And then if we compare that to reports from Asia, they have uh, a bit higher levels over there. If we could summarize that, in the most heavily polluted places, we see about uh, 10 to 800 microplastic particles per liter in rivers or lakes. And we can compare that then to the toxicity. And that's, again, like a hazard distribution. So you see now there's different species popping up as the most sensitive one. That's a mussel. Uh, that's water fleas. Um, so those are the most insensitive. That's algae uh, plotted against those that react most sensitive to microplastics. And based on that hazard data, we can conclude 
that in concentrations of between 100 and 1,000 microplastics per liter, there is something going on um, in terms of toxicity for very sensitive species. If we now compare the exposure, the probability of exposure with the probability of hazard, uh, what you're seeing is that they're still pretty far away from each other. However, there is a small overlap here that implies at very that at very heavily polluted areas there is already a risk and a negative impact of microplastics on certain species and certain habitats. <coughs> There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding this kind of analysis. However, Thomas and I have, have just like discussed this microplastics thing uh, a lot recently and I've done like kind of an extrapolation. So how will the risk develop if we apply a business as usual model? That means like we continue to litter a lot of plastic, emit a lot of plastic in the way we do today. And what you see is then that of course with our uh, business as usual model, plastics emission will rise, the risk of microplastics in the environment will rise, uh, will increase, and then we are about to see a, a, a risk ratio of one, which indicates the risk of microplastics between 2032 and 2048, so in the near future. And for me, even though there's a lot of uncertainty and ignorance and uh, non-knowledge about all those microplastic risks, that tells me that it's certainly time not to wait another couple of decades to act, but it provides for me a very strong motivation to already start acting on plastic pollution and microplastics right now. Of course, there are strings attached to this kind of risk assessment. Basically, it's, ver it's a very reductionist approach, so you're trying to bring environmental risk down to one number, which is, if you think about it, is, is a bit like silly, but that's like the way we're doing, doing it. And most of the problems with microplastics risk assessment come from the idea that all microplastics are the same. So we are treating all those different polymers, those fibers, beads, fragments, uh, we're, we're, we're treating them as one agent, which they're certainly not. And then, of course, risk assessments, they don't really look at long-term ecological impact. So what will happen, for example, if plastic litter is transporting invasive species or pathogens or things like that? Those, this is not covered by risk assessment. And then we have what I would call an exposure toxicity gap, and I, we won't talk about this today uh, in more detail, maybe tomorrow, with, with Giedre, uh, but, but we're doing like the exposure studies, the toxicity studies, we're doing with very small microplastics, whereas the environmental levels we measure for very large microplastics, so we're comparing basically apples and pears. Let's talk a bit and switch gears and talk about the impacts of microplastics on scientists. Um, and look a bit at the controversies that we're seeing over there. And this is just a reminder of the scientific process, really. So, so how, do we, how do we do science? So I mean, first, our job is to come up with some clever idea and then some clever hypotheses. We're, we're designing experiments or observational studies. We're performing those to gather data, to gather like, information. And then we're processing that, come up with kind of like new knowledge and then we're publishing that and then we're happy. What is very important in the context, I believe, of plastic pollution is to really, really keep in mind that all those steps are really translational acts. And so we're translating an idea to an experiment. We're, we're translating a set of numbers to kind of um, information and then we're bringing that to papers. And each of that step is really affected by our values and our belief systems. Um, and that creates bias, and that's what we're seeing for plastic pollution and microplastics as well. People can have the same kind of information, but they end up with very different conclusions. And uh, I believe we should be very open and aware about our values that, that really affect all those different steps of interpretation. So what I'm basically saying is that your attitudes um, as a researcher towards microplastics really depends on where you're sitting on the political compass. So when you're probably more like an authoritarian left-leaning person, you might be risk-averse and you might argue that microplastics are a problem, we need to do something, you call for legislation, just because you're, you're a bit risk-averse. If you're leaning more to the libertarian right side of things, you might be more risk-neutral. So you would say, who cares about microplastics? Show me very solid data. Before I see fish dying, there's no need to act. And you would want to avoid overprotection. 
And I believe that does not only affect our like interpretation of microplastics and plastics um, uh, data, but also, for example, data on, on pesticides and chemicals and things like that. And we are not very open about this. And I believe we should, should be more open about our values, how they really affect the way that we are doing our science. But there's also extrinsic factors, and I would make the argument that microplastics have been like a great accelerator of, of, of uh, productivity. So in the early days, you just put like microplastics in the title of your manuscript, and like the editors would go crazy and would accept it. That's of course exaggerated, but they were so keen on all this like new microplastic stuff that that just that was like a great like yeah like a facilitator and that of course resulted in a lot of papers that resulted in a lot of pl uh, press coverage and that of course has like a fe cr creates a feedback mechanism to the researcher and then really like affecting you because you want to have more you want to have more attention you want to have more papers things like that and we need to keep in mind that um, science is operating now uh, in an area of hyper competition so we are competing for careers, we are competing for PhD positions, we are competing for papers, for grants. And there is a very excellent paper that has summarized the perverse incentive that this hyper-competition is really inducing. So for example, the incentive originally was to reward researchers to increase the numbers of publications to improve productivity. However, what the actual effect of that was that we are seeing an avalanche of substandard incremental papers that peer review is reduced. Another idea was to reward uh, <coughs> researchers for increased funding to ensure that they have sufficient resources to do their stuff, right? But that has resulted really in overselling positive results, downplaying negative results. And I would make the argument that we're seeing a lot of those impacts, those perverse incentives in, 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 in microplastics research, but it's not restricted to that. So we were wondering a bit whether like, th those perverse incentives are really inducing making researchers like, exaggerate their findings. So we've been looking at about 500 papers from the peer-reviewed literature, and we've been analyzing how the researchers frame the risk of microplastics. And to our positive surprise, we found that about like two-thirds of the papers really stated that microplastics may pose a risk, or it is assumed that they might, might be a risk. So they, they really s stayed on like the balance side and said like it is a hypo hypothesis that that's like that microplastics pose a risk. We also found, uh, however, like 25% of papers that said like microplastics clearly represent a threat or they pose a <coughs> risk. So there's other researchers that already have made up their minds and they say like it's just a risk. So the interesting thing is now how does that risk framing in scientific papers really translate to risk framing in news in the public spheres and then we've been looking at newspaper articles from the New York Times uh, but also tabloids and other like outlets and we've been looking how the news is really receiving and transporting, translating this kind of risk framing coming from science. We found quite the opposite picture here. So only about 6% of newspaper reports really state facts. So they don't make any claims that microplastics pose a threat to us. 36% uh, talk about the negative impacts on the environment. Surprisingly, 43% talk about microplastics being a danger to the food chain. So for example, they lead to a spread of pollutants in the food chain, including uh, to humans. And 15% of newspaper reports even talk about negative effects on our human health. So you see there's a complete detachment between what we see in the scientific literature and what is reported really in the news. And we were wondering how this translation, why, why is this translation of risk really happening? And of course, I talked about perverse incentives. So of course, neoliberalism, the hyper-competition is driving this kind of hyperbolic communication uh, in form of press releases. But what we believe is really that there is a translational problem uh, in how we frame risk. So as when we say as, as, as researchers, microplastics may be a risk, this is perceived by the public that microplastics are a risk. And this is why they have different conceptions of risk. So for us, risk is the probability of a negative outcome, whereas for the public, the uncertainty of a negative outcome becomes risk. So we don't know that microplastics is a problem. That becomes the risk already, not knowing the uncertainty.
And I believe like we're not really as scientists communicating the stuff. We're not really aware that a may is becoming an R. And we should, should think about that more, especially when we talk about those like uh, public issues. Finally, what does society or do societies like make out of plastics really? So there's very little empirical data what public, the, the public, so to say, really believes about plastic pollution. There is a re representative study on, on Europeans uh, with 16,000 participants across the European Union. 74% of Europeans were worried about the impacts of plastic on their health. Even more, 87% were worried about the impact of plastics to the environment. So based on that, at least for Europe, you can say that the societies, the public has made their decision. They don't want to have plastic pollution in the environment, and that, that includes also microplastics. <coughs> and we're struggling a bit as scientists to, 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 to really understand why that really happened, because like, we know that knowledge is not complete. We don't know everything. We need to know more, investigate more. But the public has been informed by scientific arguments. So for example, they're very aware about the ubiquity of plastic pollution. They know it's everywhere. And that's a scientific fact. They're aware about the persistence of plastic pollution. So they're aware it's not going to go away over decades or even uh, centuries. And they have a pretty good feeling, I believe, also about the irreversibility of the problem. So even though some people want to go out there and clean the, the mess that we have made in the oceans, they're quite like clear that that's not going to work, really. However, they're also informed by non-scientific, I would say, arguments. And, and the most prominent one is the visibility of plastic pollution. Everybody has seen it. Just go to the beach, go to the river, go wherever you, you want to go. You find plastic litter. You can touch it, it's tangible, you can clean it up, you can collect it, you have agency over it, so you can just go out there and do something about it, clean it up. And that really drives the, the, the overall decision making in the public, but that visibility also touches on aesthetic and moral values. So if you see a picture of that dying whale or albatross, of course that touches your mor morals, and it, it really touches on, on, on how we should treat um, natural environments. But I would also make the argument that the whole plastic debate is embedded in a larger societal context. And I would make the argument that the public is using plastic pollution just as a symbol for other things. So they use it as a symbol for global change going on at the largest scale, so habitat loss, uh, climate change, for instance. Just because that's something you can see, you can touch, you can do something about it. <coughs> but they're very good at connecting dots and just using it as a, as a representative for global change at the large scale. Just some concluding thoughts. So there is a lot of attention to plastic pollution in the news, in the public sphere, in academia. But I wonder if we should really just take a step back and should be really clear about what the challenge is. So is the challenge really that people are using toothpaste with some microplastic beads in it? Is that really the challenge? I would make the argument the challenge is rather that all those phenomena are interconnected. So it's not either climate change or plastic pollution. They are really entangled and, and connected. And we need to be very clear that, that we need to address this larger Anthropocene issue. We need to also be clear about what the causes are. So it's not like people using throwaway plastic uh, coffee uh, cups. But the problem is really like this kind of extractive linear economic model that we're using. Extracting oil, making plastic, using it for half an hour before it comes waste. We really need to under address this, the underlying, the root cause of the problem. And in the overall debate, we're really bad as scientists to talk about our values. And I believe <coughs> the, all those decisions are really value-laden. It's always about also our morals, our aesthetics, and things like that. And as scientists, we need to appreciate that and be very clear about that. So with that, I just thank you for your attention and hope you have some comments for me. <laughs>